Okay, so what we're doing today is we are covering um, the rest of the visual perception chapter, which is basically looking at perceptual constancies and then looking at um, how taste perception works. Okay, so that's basically what we're doing today. And it's kind of like pretty much a repetition or kind of related to what we've um, covered in the previous class. So when we talk about perceptual constancies, perceptual constancies is basically talking about three types of uh, three concepts that basically um, demonstrate how our brain knows that a particular concept is constant, okay? So there might be changes to the image that's actually um, cast onto the retina, but in reality, our brain knows that just because the person is, for example, moving further away from me, they're not actually physically getting smaller, they're just more distant or further distanced away from me. Okay, so just because I look at an object from the side or from a different angle, it doesn't mean that the original shape has actually changed in, um, in reality. Okay, so that's basically um, the three types of constancies that we're going to be looking at are size constancy, shape constancy, and brightness constancy. And we'll go through them in a little bit more depth in each of the next few slides. So just remember perceptual constancy, perceptual um, refers to your feelings or your sensations, your ability to perceive those sensations and constancy is referring to something remaining constant or unchanging or the same. So the first type of constancy we're looking at is size constancy, okay? Size constancy is a concept that suggests that an object's actual size remains the same, even though the size of the image that you see, or in other words, the size of the image that's cast onto the retina changes. So this is very similar to yesterday, what we did um, when we looked at pictorial cues and that pictorial cue called relative size, okay? Relative size is connected to size constancy. So remember I showed you an image yesterday of um, uh, two guys that are basically sitting on chairs in a corridor or in a hallway. And basically what um, one of the guys, the guy sitting at the front looks a lot bigger than the guy sitting in the background, okay? But just because this guy sitting in the background looks smaller, it doesn't mean that he suddenly shrunk or like, you know, magically made himself smaller. It's just because he is sitting in the distance, okay? So we know and our brain knows that even though the image of the guy in the blue shirt at the back has become smaller, we are able to still perceive him or understand that he is the same size as the guy sitting in the front, but just because he's like sitting a little bit further away from us, he looks smaller, okay? So that's basically size constancy. Shape constancy is um, this idea that an object shape will remain the same, even though there's a change in how we actually view that shape or how that shape is actually cast onto your retina. So if you look at a clock from the front, it looks like a circle, like a circle three-dimensional shape. If you look at, look at it from the side though, it looks a little bit more flat, okay? You don't see that circular shape as much. If you look at it from another, another angle, it might look like a mixture of both. But what shape constancy suggests is that no matter which side we look at a shape, I'm sorry, no matter what side or angle we look at an object from, the actual original shape of the object will remain the same. Okay, and that's basically our brain's ability to know that the shape of the object remains constant, regardless of which angle or which perspective we look at it from. Okay, the other example is the door example. So when you look at a door, it just looks like a rectangular thing when it's closed, a rectangular shape. When you open the door fully, it might look like a different shape, okay? It doesn't look exactly rectangular and it exactly as wide as it used to be when it was closed. But that doesn't mean that when you open the door, that the door suddenly has changed in shape or that it shape shifted or something like that. It's still the same door. It's just that the angle through which we're looking at the door has become different, okay? But the actual shape of the door remains the same. All right, and the last um, type of constancy that we look at is called brightness constancy. Brightness constancy is this idea that an object's color intensity or will remain the same, um, even, even though there's a change in the amount of light that's being reflected from the object to the retina. So in other words, um, if I've got a little, I don't even know what that is, it's probably like a piece of paper. Okay, if I've got a piece of paper and I cast a shadow and then I divide this entire area into a square, and then I divide it into, okay, um, and I name each square with a letter, like A, B, C, D. I know that the color of part A and part C are the same, okay? But because of the shadow that's cast on C, it looks a little bit darker. But that doesn't make my brain go, oh, actually, color C is a different 
um, sorry, square C is a different color than square A. I still know that square C and square A are actually the same color because they're on the same strip of paper. And that no matter what kind of shade comes onto the paper, that originally they were both the same color. Okay, so that's what brightness constancy is. It's your brain's ability to know that the brightness or the color of an object is constant um, regardless of what sh shadow you cast upon it or regardless of um, any kind of dimness or lack of brightness that might be in any part of that picture or object. Does that make sense to everybody? Are there any questions? No? Okay. Um, so what we'll do then is we'll move on to the next topic. The next topic is called perceptual set. And perceptual set is like a fun topic because it's kind of like connected to those like little optical illusion things you see. Perceptual set is basically your expectations, okay? Um, when we talk about perceptual set, it's your readiness or your expectation to view something in a particular perspective that matches your expectations. Okay, so perceptual set basically causes our visual perception to be influenced by some kind of predetermined judgment, by some kind of predetermined expectation there. Okay, sometimes when we look at a particular thing, we expect it to look in a particular way. Okay, so this is kind of like, this is kind of the reason why, you know, you have those little internet viral, viral memes and things going around like, um, is, this, is the colour of this dress gold or blue, like all that stuff. Okay, that's basically... Um, connected to this idea of perceptual set, that two different people can look at the same picture and one person will think the dress looks gold, another person will think the dress looks blue. Okay, one, two different people will look at the same picture of a dog, one person will think it looks like a dog, another person will think it looks like a little boy carrying, um, carrying like um, a lollipop or something. I don't know. So that's basically what perceptual set is about. It's all about our expectations. We perceive things in our environment in line with our expectations of what we expect that to be, okay? And everybody's perceptual set for that reason is gonna be different. So I've just given, I've just put some examples now on this slide here of some examples of perceptual set, like little images, okay? So just have a quick look at these images um, and just kind of, like when you first look at it, don't overanalyze it, just have a quick look, make a snap judgment. What does that look like to you? So I'll give everybody about maybe 20 seconds or so to just choose one or two. And what's the first thing that you see when you look at that? Alrighty, so, um, yeah, so the first one's kind of obvious. So it's the same image, but some people will actually see an old woman and some people will see a young woman. Um, and obviously, depending on which part of the image you're paying more attention to, depending on if you've seen images like this before, um, all of those like predetermined judgments or predetermined factors will determine what you see. So for me, at least personally, when I first saw this um, picture, I thought that it resembled more of the young woman look to me. I didn't really see the old woman. And when I realized that, oh, there is an old woman in this picture, that's when I started to actually look for, um, look for the ideas or look for the signs where the old woman was kind of apparent, okay? So obviously, um, unless you're really looking for it, it's really hard to tell. Um, with this, um, did you see a musician or a girl's face? So when I first looked at this picture, I actually saw a girl's face with the silhouette and the eyes and the nose and the mouth. Okay? But if you look at it from this way, if you're focusing on not the figure, but actually the background part of this image, you might see a, little, um, a guy, so that's his nose, and then obviously um, he's playing some kind of musical instrument. There. And I've just made a big mess on that image there. Um, yeah, so that's basically... Um, that one. With the third image here, um, some people, when they first look at this image, they see a um, rabbit. If they look at it, if they focus on the right-hand side of the image, that, that being the rabbit's um, face and eye and then the ears. Some people, if they focus more on the left-hand side of the image, they think of it as being like a bird or a duck, okay, with that one being kind of like the beak and then that's the eye. So honestly, with this one, when I first looked at it, my snap judgment was that it was a a rabbit for some reason. 
Um, okay, with this one here, some people, when they first look at this, so I'll tell you what I saw when I first looked at it. When I first looked at this image, I saw a horse or a kangaroo's head, like something like that, with those two being the ears and then those being the eyes and then that being the little snout or the nose. Um, but when I really started looking at it and I was trying to look at, okay, what else could it be other than a kangaroo's head or a horse's head? Um, I realized that it could be a seal because those are the kind of flippers and then that's the kind of face and you've got the whiskers there for the seal and the little flippers there. Okay, so that's one other thing it could be. This one's kind of similar. So some people, when they look at this image, they see a trainer and a seal balancing a ball on its head. Other people see a lady and a man um, on a dance floor. And the last image here, when some people look at this, they see a Native American ornament, um, that being the head, the hair, and the ears, and the mouth, and the nose. Some people see a little Eskimo, Eskimo um, boy looking into a cave, okay? So that being the cave, and that's being him all dressed up in the jacket and his legs. Um, so yeah, it's like, I don't know, perceptual set is a really fun topic because it's like you can look at all these different things and everyone always has a different response. It makes some people might see something in there that other people didn't even think of. So again, it really depends on how you look at that image. So those are examples of how your perceptual set, that is your preconceived, pre, um, predetermined expectations and judgments, can determine how you visually perceive an image. Okay, so that basically um, <coughs> brings us to essentially almost the end of um, chapters of the visual perception part. The final thing we're just gonna look at before we go on to taste perception is looking at the factors. Okay, why is it that in the previous slide, why is it that two people can look at the same picture and one person thinks it looks like a girl and another person thinks it looks like a musician? Okay, and not just with reference to those pictures, but with reference to real life. Why is it that some people look at a cloud and be like, oh, that just looks like a little bunny? And why is it that some people say, no, I can't see that, it just looks like a normal cloud to me? The, these are the reasons or these are the factors that influence how we um, drive the expectations or judgments that cause us to have different perceptual sets or different expectations when we look at something. Um, so the first thing is our culture. So if you come from a remote village where there's no access to technology and someone shows you a picture of an iPad, you're not gonna be able to make a visual perception or make meaning of what that iPad is, okay? Obviously, all of you guys, the minute I show you an iPad, you would be able to identify what that is. But if I were to show you something, some kind of technology they use from the 1800s or in another um, country other than Australia, you might have a little bit of difficulty there. Um, the next thing that we do, um, the next thing that can affect your um, perceptual set or your expectations is context. Context is basically the setting or the environment that influences your perception. So if you've ever seen uh, a teacher out of school um, and you've not recognized them straight away, it might be because you are so used to seeing them at school, okay? And you're not used to seeing them in an out of school setting, okay? There's another memory tip, which I, there's another, not memory tip, sorry. There's another um, thing that they use, similar to the images in the previous slide, where, um, it looks, I'll just draw it. It looks something like this. So it's one, no, it's not one. It's a, okay. And in the actual um, image or in the actual original thing, it's supposed to be A13 CD. But a lot of people, when they look at it and are asked to read what's on the image, they read it as A, B, C, D, because they expect that because the rest are alphabetical letters, then this one's got to be an alphabetical letter too, even though it's actually the number 13. Okay, so that's another example of context, that the things around a specific visual image can also influence how you perceive that image. Um, your emotional state, so how you feel can emotionally influence your perception. And we learn about this as well when we look at unit four next year in, um, when we do phobias, okay? If you've got a phobia of spiders, you might see a little piece of thread on the floor and you might think of that as being a spider. So again, your emotional thing, state towards a specific object or thing can influence how you view that thing as well. Um, your motivation. So if you're watching a soccer match, um, you might make more, pers you might, um, you know, tune in a little bit more into all the goals that your team makes. So as your team is kind of like, moving towards the goal, you know, towards making the goal, you pay more attention and you're making more meaning of those visual scenes in your head rather than the ones, rather than the shots that your team misses. 
Okay, and the last thing that influences our perceptual set or our preconceived expectations for visual images and things is our past experiences. So for some of you in the previous slide, if, if you've already seen one or, one or more of those images, you might have already stuck to that perception that you, so if you've already seen the one of the musician or the girl, and you, originally last time you saw it, you thought it was a girl, this time as well, you're still gonna think it's a girl. So like I said, you gotta make those snap judgments because if you don't, your past experiences will come in and influence how you visually perceive that thing. Um, also, if you are in the middle of the airport and you're just, you know, you're just moving to your next terminal, getting ready to board your plane, you might not notice a um, unattended piece of luggage that's lying right in the middle of the terminal. But for an airport security guard or security officer whose job it is to make sure that the airport is secure and safe, they might straight away visually perceive that unattended bag and they might run towards it to make sure that they can get it out of harm's way in case there's something in there. Okay, so that's basically talking about past experiences and basically your life, your background and all that stuff. Okay, so these are the different factors now that influence how you visually perceive any kind of thing, whether it be an object, whether it's a situation, whether it's an event, okay, you're basically where your focus goes to and how you make meaning that is how you visually perceive that particular situation, object, or event. Okay, so those are the, our main factors. Just know the basic meaning of each and just the one example. So you can just use the examples that are on this slide. Alrighty, so the next topic that we're looking at now, and this is gonna basically conclude chapter seven for us, is taste perception. Okay, so taste perception is this idea, and for a lot of you, for a lot of you, this. Um, this chapter is going to make or this spread is going to make a lot more sense compared to visual perception um, because some of the stuff we're going to learn about, for example, the tastes, um, the different types of taste, the different types of factors that influence taste, um, they are things that are, we can kind of connect a little bit more to real life compared to the visual perception side. Okay, so taste perception is basically defined as the ability to um, understand the sensation that's produced when any substance in your mouth reacts chemically with taste receptor cells on your tongue, okay? We're not specifying, specifying it to food because for example, when you were young, um, if you ever like, um, you know, scraped your finger on something and your finger started bleeding, a lot of kids have this habit of just sticking their finger right into their mouth straight away to get rid of the blood. Um, and if you've ever tasted blood, you'd notice that blood does have a kind of like, I don't know, metallic -y kind of taste. Um, and so obviously it's not just food that, causes our um, you know, taste receptor cells to react and cause some kind of taste there, but it's any substance, okay? So that's basically um, why we say it's any substance in the mouth reacting chemically, because that's how um, taste perception works, with the taste receptor cells on your tongue. And we're gonna learn more about what the taste receptor cells are in the next slide. So taste reception is also known as gustation, okay? So if whenever we're talking about gustation or gustatory cells, or gustatory perception, we are simply talking about taste perception. Okay, and as we mentioned um, in the previous lecture when we were looking at the lobes of the brain, um, taste perception is um, mainly handled by the frontal lobe of the brain where you've got a small area called the primary gustatory cortex. Okay, we haven't learned about that specific area, but just for the purpose of this spread, um, it's good to know what it is. All right, so what are the purposes behind why we taste? Okay, why is it important for humans to set taste? Why can't we just simply eat food, get no taste out of it, and just simply get the energy and just survive? Well, the reason is that taste is not just important for us to enjoy food, but taste is important for us to understand which food tastes normal or typical or fine, and which food tastes off. So if you've ever had the unfortunate circumstance of having dairy that might be off, so having some kind of um, milk or yogurt or something that's gone off maybe one or two days, um, you might realize that it tastes like maybe really sour. Um, sometimes we use our smell to determine whether a taste, um, sorry, to determine whether a food is still good or not. But sometimes we skip that step and we accidentally go and actually eat it anyway. And this is when our taste can help us determine um, if a food is dangerous to eat, if it might have gone off or it's expired or it's stale. Okay, and for this reason, taste can actually help us to survive. If you couldn't taste if a food went off and you do, were just continuing to drink that glass of milk, even though it was completely off, um, that could affect your health. You could get food poisoning. You could be in bed for the next two days, um, you know. Um, so that's basically what 
one purpose of taste is. The next purpose of taste is that it's important for us to understand how things taste because certain health conditions can actually um, arise if we don't have a good sense of taste. So for, with certain health conditions um, or with certain people, they might have a lower sensitivity, sensitivity to sugar. So a normal person who might put maybe one teaspoon of sugar in their tea, um, this person might need about four or five teaspoons to make it taste the same level of sweetness. Okay, and for a person like that, when you're having that much sugar in your tea every day, um, they're going to increase the chances of them becoming overweight or obese. So the minute we realize that we don't taste salt um, in the same way as other people, or we don't taste sugar in the same way as other people, um, it's obviously important to go to the doctor and see if there's any underlying health condition or underlying allergies or intolerances that might be the result of that. So again, taste perception and taste can actually help us determine health issues as well. Okay, taste buds. So now we're learning about taste buds and we all know what taste buds are. We've heard of this word before many times, even before we did psychology. Um, but you need to understand the different kind of structures that are involved in taste buds. So taste buds are kind of held in um, a little bump kind of, I call it a bump couch, um, bump pouch, sorry. It's kind of held in a little pouch that's kind of got a bump-like structure called papillae. Okay, papillae um, are not permanent. So let's say you were born with a certain number of papillae on your tongue. That's not the only papillae you're going to have for the rest of your life. In fact, papillae actually replace themselves once every 10 days. Because, you know, as humans, we, we often like destroy our papillae. Because think about it, if you've ever, with me, like as soon as I have a hot mug of coffee, I've just got to drink it straight away. I can't wait for it to cool. And then I burn my tongue. Or, you know, you burn your tongue eating spicy food or really sour lollies. All that kind of stuff can actually um, mess up your papillae. So obviously it is important for your papillae to be replaced once every 10 days. So you can continue to taste things in the most effective and clear way possible. Okay. Um, most papillae contain taste buds, but like I said before, some of your papillae contain pain receptors. Okay. So when you eat something really, really spicy, um, whether it's chili, whether it's wasabi, whether it's um, some kind of really sour lolly, I guess, your pain receptors in your tongue will start to get activated. And these pain receptors are, some of them are actually located within your papillae. Okay, if you look at this diagram here, you can see that the papillae, um, there are different types of papillae. You don't need to know the actual names of these. Okay, that's just going to make it too complicated. You just need to understand that the papillae are bump-like structures, small, small bumps on your tongue. And that if you were to zoom into those bumps, you would realize that they actually contain your taste buds and they do contain the pain receptors. So I'm just going to cross out these names because I don't want you guys to be worried or confused. Okay, I've just taken this diagram from the internet. So it's not very, um, it's not exactly, it's got some more difficult things than we do need to know. Alrighty, so most papillae contain taste buds, but some contain pain receptors. So obviously when we're talking about pain receptors, we are talking about those parts of your tongue that do sense pain, okay? And you would notice this when you um, eat certain foods like spicy foods. Sometimes if you've got a really creamy block of chocolate um, or you're eating your pizza, you would sense the heat, okay? How, how hot the pizza is. You might sense how creamy and how like velvety the chocolate is, okay? Your ability to sense those textures and those temperatures is also because of your papillae. Now, obviously, as you get older, the number of taste buds that you have will decrease, as with all, as with many other um, bodily functions, as with a lot of other things. Um, you are not going to be able to taste as well as um, you did when you were younger. Okay, and so that's why you might realize that older people they love to eat chocolate, but then um, they don't really get the same enjoyment they did out of it as compared to when they were younger. And okay, now most taste buds are on the tongue, um, but you do have taste buds at the back of your mouth. Okay, you do have taste buds on the roof of your mouth as well. So um, yeah, taste buds are not only on the tongue itself, okay? But most of your taste buds, the majority of them are. Alrighty, so let's just move on to the next slide. So what are taste receptors? Taste receptors are the sensory receptors within the taste buds, okay? So inside your taste buds, so remember your papillae, 
contain the taste buds and inside the taste buds, you've got your taste receptors. Now the taste receptors do most of the work. They're the ones that detect the chemical molecules that are in food or in any other substance. And they allow us to experience taste because they're the main ones that allow us to experience taste. Um, taste receptors are also called gustatory cells. Gustatory basically meaning taste, okay? So taste cells. So those are what taste receptors are. Remember the word taste receptors? The word taste receptors comes from, sorry, the word receptors comes from the word receive. So taste receptors essentially receive all the taste related information that you get once you've consumed a particular food, drink, or any other substance. All righty. Um, Okay, so this is just a kind of like zoomed in diagram of the actual kind of processes that take place. If you just look at it, like you've got the front of the tongue, you don't need to know the names, like I said, but that's the front of the tongue. Then you've got the middle part of the tongue and then you've got the back part of the tongue. And there are there, there is research that says that some people will experience, for example, most of the sweet things that you eat, you taste the sweetness from the front of the tongue. Um, and like the bitter things are most felt at the back of the tongue. Again, like we don't learn specifically about that topic in this spread, but it's something interesting to think about next time you're eating something. Okay, because we never really think about how we taste things, but maybe after you've finished this topic, you will understand it. Um, anyway, this is um, again the papillae. So you've got the papillae. This is a zoomed in version of those small bumps on your tongue. So, um, so all these little small, small bumps on your, oh God. I need to get the texture thing coming up. Oh, blue. Okay, so all these like little bumps on your tongue, if we were to zoom them in, they'd look something like that. Okay, and so that outer layer there is the actual papillae. And you can see that inside the papillae, you've got the taste buds. And then inside the taste buds, all this area here is the taste receptor. So you can see that the majority of our area under the papillae is our taste receptors because they are the ones that allow us to experience the taste. Alrighty, um, we don't need to know about microvilli, we will learn about the taste pores in the next slide. So obviously with taste pores, in the same way, when you think about the word pore, um, you think about skin, so you know your pores are opening, your pores closing, all that stuff. Um, so a taste pore is similar to a skin pore, okay? A taste pore are basically small external openings of a taste bud. And what they do is they connect the tongue's surface to the taste receptors. So without a taste pore, you wouldn't be able to really precisely taste foods and drinks in the way that you do, okay? And this is a small diagram of how taste buds work, showing you um, the example of the taste pore. So the small external openings, which then open into the rest of part of the tongue that will detect that taste. Tastants, tastants are basically, when you have consumed a food or drink, the dissolved chemical molecules that you can taste because essentially you're not tasting a food, right? You're tasting the chemical molecules which are detected by your tongue from that food, okay? Um, essentially everything we eat and drink then is a chemical molecule. So tastants are basically the name given to the dissolved chemical molecules that come out of the food once we have, um, you know, once, once it reaches our tongue and our taste receptors. Now, as we talked about before, um, None of our senses ever truly work in isolation with one um, by, by themselves, I mean. Um, in fact, our sense of smell can also influence how we taste food, okay? And this is why um, when you're really sick, you can't taste anything and because you, when you've got a blocked nose because you can't smell food as much as well, okay? So that's basically talking about how other senses can also influence senses like taste. And obviously senses like vision, like if food looks good, we're more likely to believe that it's tasty, but we will learn more about that in the next chapter when we look at distortions of perception. So we will look at taste again in the next chapter. So in a quick summary, basically, how does it work? So when you eat an apple, like I said, the chemical molecules will combine with the saliva on your tongue. And obviously your saliva's got um, the enzymes in it to break down that apple. So it's like, the more you break it down, the more um, taste you're gonna get out of that apple, in other words, okay? so. Um, that's the stimulus part of it. That's receiving the thing that you're eating. The next part is reception. Reception is when um, the taste receptors are activated and obviously 
Um, some, obviously the main taste of the apple is going to be done through the taste receptors, but some of the uh, texture related information, so the apple being crisp or the apple feeling a bit mushy, all that kind of stuff will be connected to um, your papillae, okay? Because like we said, the papillae is in charge of texture related information. The next step will be transduction. So transduction is obviously the process of converting. So obviously um, when it comes to taste receptors, we can't just simply send um, you know, this information directly to the brain. It first has to be uh, conducted or converted, sorry, into um, neural impulses, okay, that can travel through a neural pathway to the brain. So taste receptors, essentially what they do is they convert the chemical molecules in the food into signals, okay, and these signals are neural in nature, neural meaning um, in, a, in a form that can be easily transmitted to the brain via the pathways in the brain. And the last step is perception. So perception is when we actually make sense of how a food tastes. Make, I'm just writing with my mouse at this point, so it's very messy. Okay, so you're making sense of how a food tastes. Okay, so obviously your facial nerve carries this neural signals to the thalamus and then to the gustatory cortex. Now we've already looked at the thalamus before in unit one, the thalamus is kind of like a filter. Okay, when you're eating a food, it's very hard to ignore the taste of the food, unless you're one of those people that just eats like a robot, okay, while you're doing a million other things. Um, if you're eating a specific type of food, the taste hits you straight away, at least on the first bite. Um, and so your thalamus automatically becomes aware of this and directs your attention to the taste of the food. And that's when you might tell someone, oh, wow, this um, pasta is so delicious, or this cake is so chocolatey, it's so rich, okay? It's because your thalamus has directed your attention to the taste of the food. And then it travels to the gustatory cortex. So the gustatory cortex is the part of the frontal lobe. It's involved in taste perception. Okay, so the gustatory cortex processes your perception of the apple as tasting sweet, or tasting crisp, or tasting um, sour, whatever the taste you feel is. Okay, so those are the four processes involved in taste perception from a biological perspective. Okay, so just to finish off this spread on taste perception, um, we all know that there are five basic tastes. So we've got sweet, we've got sour, we've got salty, we've got bitter. These ones you'll be familiar with. And there's another one called umami. Some of you might be familiar with umami. Um, umami is a different taste from the rest because umami is more like... Um, it's kind of best described as being like a savory taste. It doesn't fit into any of the other categories, um, but it's kind of like a savory, meaty, nutty kind of taste, okay? It's a taste that you usually find um, when you eat things like uh, meat, when you eat things like mushroom. If you've ever had sushi and you cannot eat sushi without soy sauce, it's because soy sauce is a very good source of umami as well. Umami is one of those um, tastes that we really crave for because they are very savory in nature and it's a taste that we don't find in any of the other um, examples of the basic tastes, okay? Sometimes we feel like something sweet, sometimes, yeah, we do feel like something salty. And if you're still not satisfied after trying both of those tastes, maybe it's because you're craving something that's umami, okay? Umami is a taste in and of itself and it's a recently discovered taste as well, okay? So that's basically, so with this slide, honestly, there's not much to learn. We're not going to ask you to give a definition of sour food, but we might give you to we might ask you some at some point to identify one example of a sour food. And so, you know, questions like that are so easy. Kids usually write sour lollies for sweet. They'll write like um, cake. Okay, maybe the only one you've got to learn is for umami because umami is kind of like a newer one. So you can write soy sauce. You can write mushrooms. Um, you can write meat. Okay, all of those are savory foods that are usually associated with being. Um, umami related. Alrighty, so those are your five basic tastes. Um, and the last thing we're really looking at for today, and I, and I will say that hopefully this is the last, last thing. Okay, yes, I believe it is the last thing. So the last thing we're looking at is a really interesting thing talking about what are the influences on taste? So why is it that similar to visual perception, why is it that two people will, will eat the same bowl of pasta in a restaurant and one person will rate it like nine out of 10 and another person will rate it like three out of 10. Why is it that even though we eat the same food, we taste that food differently? Okay, so we're just looking at the different factors or influences on taste. So when we're looking at biological influences, we look at two specific ones. The first one is age and the second one is genetics. Now, 
When we're looking at age, babies are actually drawn to sweet foods and they don't like bitter foods, okay? Um, if you looked at that meme on the previous slide of the uh, mother feeding the baby a piece of lemon, um, sour foods, bitter foods, babies don't like them. They, they pinch their noses up to them. They don't like it, okay? They like sweet foods. That's why when you give a baby or when you give a two or three year old their first taste of Nutella or their first taste of lollies, they're like, they become like instant addicts. They just want more, okay? Even the first thing that infants have, which is like breast milk, is sweet. It's like, um, it tastes like normal milk, like it's sweet in nature. It's not bitter or sour, okay? Um, when we're talking about um, children being more taste responsive, that's because they've got more taste buds. As we mentioned before, your taste perception decreases as you get older because your taste buds do um, decrease in number. Your genetics, so specific genetics can cause some people to taste differently. And this is really weird because like um, when you're a child, the food might taste in a particular way to you, but then when you get older, you might actually start to like that food and even like crave that food, okay? Some people, when they eat broccoli and spinach, they think it's the most bitter thing they've ever had. Some people can't live without broccoli and spinach. They could literally have it every day, um, okay? Another interesting one is coriander. So any of you who've had coriander, um, it's that green herb they garnish on top of curries sometimes. Um, coriander, for some people who have a specific gene, tastes like soap. And to be honest, personally for me, when I was young, um, when I, whenever I would taste coriander, all I would taste, I thought I was eating soap. It just tasted so bad. But now, like, I love coriander. Like, I've even tried to grow coriander in my garden and it's, like, not worked. That's how much I love coriander. Um, and for me now, it doesn't taste like soap. So it's really weird. It, it might be an age thing as well. I'm not sure. Anyway, the next influence that we look at is psychological influences. So um, like we said before, your perceptual set, okay? How a food is packaged. How a food sounds when you're eating it. If someone gives you a bag of potato chips and you eat that and you don't get that classic crunch sound or crunch noise coming out of that, you're not going to feel 100% satisfied with eating that bag of chips. You're going to be like, oh, something was missing. Appearance. If I give you a glass of lemonade and it's color blue, you're going to be like, you're not going to enjoy it as much as a glass of lemonade that's nice and yellow. Um, the shape of the food. If I give you a pizza that is a hexagonal shape rather than a nice triangular slice, you're not going to get the same enjoyment. Okay, and we're going to learn more about this. It's, it's such an interesting topic, but we are going to learn more about perceptual set on taste and the effect of color, packaging, brightness, all that stuff in the next chapter. Um, and the last influence we're looking at is social influence on taste. So obviously the culture you come from will determine what kind of food you see as tasty, as well as the kind of uh, taste that you prefer. So in some foods, uh, a higher number of bitter foods are eaten, okay? Sorry, in some cultures. In some cultures, spicier foods are consumed, okay? Whereas in other cultures, spicier foods are less consumed. Um, in some cultures, specific foods are eaten, whereas in other cultures, those foods might be considered disgusting or not normal or not uh, palatable or appetizing. All right, so obviously, depending, depending on the culture that you come from, the kind of food that you like will, um, will differ or will be different and the kind of food that you taste or that you believe is tasty or not tasty will also be different and the last thing is your mother's food preferences so obviously um, um there's a lot of you know literature out there that says that babies um that you know babies are affected by what their mothers eat while they're in the stomach while they're in their mom's tummy so um a lot of the time, that doesn't mean that if your mum was just eating kale and spinach, that you're going to grow up loving kale and spinach. It just means that with certain foods, babies might actually develop a liking for those foods, okay? just Not just while they're in the uterus or while they're in their mummy's tummy, but also once they're born, okay, the kind of food that the mum is serving the kids, okay? You guys, when you were young, you would just eat what your mum made you. So if you're growing up on processed foods, on junk foods, um, you might grow to start to like that because that's all you've really been exposed to. Whereas if your mother has always made, um, you know, really nice home cooked meals, pasta, rice, um, and kind of like served healthy foods as well and veggies and cooked them up in a nice way, you're going to be more likely to believe that those foods are tasty and that those foods do taste good. Okay, so it's like the influence of family and what the mother serves and stuff as well. Alrighty, so I think that brings us to the end of today's content. Yes, it does. Good. So that basically also brings us to the end of our chapter seven. So um, yeah, just look at what you need to do for taste perception on the week three course outline. 
I'll just also quickly share my screen with you so I can just show you what I've uploaded. Um, first thing, I will stop the recording.